this is a podcast of the main features of the workshop that we conducted together in week one of Introduction to Educational Settings, TCHE 2405. Schools are really familiar places. Most of you have spent at least 12 years in one. Some people think that makes them an expert in schools and schooling, but does it? Being a student or a parent of students, of some, as some of you may be, gives us a particular perspective about schools as places where education takes place. In this course, we want to start to challenge your perspectives about those spaces where education takes place, or might we think of where schooling occurs, to provide you with moments of discomfort as we ask you to question your beliefs, be they explicit or tacit, and to explore other possibilities. So how will we do this? Introducing ideas. In the time that we have together, it's not possible to explore many concepts in any great depth. Instead, we'll use our time together to introduce you to ideas, to theories, to ways of seeing and thinking about where education takes place and what things act to shape that and to shape you. As master's level students, we expect you to use your own time to explore these ideas further by engaging with the set readings, by engaging with additional references that might appear in the lecture component of our time together, and to go beyond what we ask you to read and find other articles, books, YouTube videos, and so on that relate to our topics. This course is called Introduction to Education Settings, and it will introduce you to education settings. But in the process, one of the objectives that we have is to get you to think about who you are as a person and as a teacher, to get you thinking about issues of identity, your identity as a teacher. What kind of a teacher do you want to be? Why? What beliefs do you have about what purpose schools serve, about the role of schools and about the role of the teacher? What other factors are at play that impact on those spaces where education takes place? Those different settings, some of which are schools but not all, and what factors impact on you as a teacher? I briefly outlined the structure of this course. It's a little different from most of your courses that run on campus all semester. We have five weeks here on campus, followed by five single days when you are placed in schools. Whilst we're on campus, we'll have two hour lectorials together. Lectorials is a new word that the university sector has invented. Um, that really means a combination of a bit of lecture, a bit of tutorial. To get the most out of the tutorials, we ask that you engage with the pre-workshop tasks and bring them with you to class. I'll be talking at you sometimes, but mostly it's a conversation where I'll be talking with you and the other teaching staff in the course will be talking with you as well. During the five single days that you have in schools, we expect you to be in those schools from 8.30 to 5.30 every day. You'll be undertaking some observations and audit tasks that we ask you to, do, to undertake, but you'll also be doing some of your own. You'll be doing some online reflective tasks with your tutor in your particular groups. And on those days, of course, you get to practice your teaching. One of the first questions I asked during the lecture was why do we have schools? This was one of the pre-workshop tasks I asked you to engage with. We entered a Today's Meet um, website, a room within Today's Meet, where people were asked to nominate their top aim for schools. And what was interesting was some of the outcomes, and I'll share those with you all. A lot of you talked about identity issues, self-awareness, the purpose in life, helping young people find their place in society. Others talked about equity issues, equality, equal chance of learning for all. Others talked about the need for schools to foster creativity and innovation, to encourage young people to explore their curiosity and interests, and to nurture a desire to learn and develop. Interestingly, and somewhat cynically, I asked you the question, do we actually need a school to do this? Don't children have creativity and innovation and curiosity um, as an innate characteristic when they're very young. And one of the things that I observe is as children get older, those uh, schools tend to beat those 
value, those properties out of them, those characteristics out of them. Sorry for my cynicism. Others talked about the aim of schooling to inspire the next generation to improve the society they live in. All wonderful, wonderful aims. But I guess the purpose of that exercise was to um, identify for you that the purpose or the aim of schools is a really contested arena where different people argue for different things. For some, education is a way of ensuring social control and reproduction. If everyone is educated in the norms of a society, then those norms will re be reproduced, resulting in a stable society rather than an archaic rabble. Some would go so far as to say that education is therefore a mechanism for social control. But one of the criticisms of this is that the norms that tend to be taught in schools here in Australia are those norms of the white Western middle class. What then of norms that are other, that are not part of the white Western middle class? Schools are seen as places where we can teach things that some families don't, team to, don't seem to teach. The values education movement of a deco, decade ago is an example of this. If we use schools to teach values, then those values will be enacted across society. That's okay, as long as everybody agrees with the values. Whose values are, are being taught, though? And who is silenced in the process? Education is also seen as an opportunity for everyone. Governments fund state-owned schools to provide equal access to all so that everyone can su succeed. Every bright and motivated student has the opportunity su to, for success regardless of background. But we'll see in a couple of weeks' time that this isn't necessarily the case at all for many students at our schools. Schooling is not a level playing field. Background makes a difference. Schools are also tasked charged with the task of equipping students with the knowledge and skills to function as successful workers in the economy. In recent times, we've seen the appearance of new skills and attributes schools are asked to develop in their students, 21st century skills that, that accommodate the demands of a global economy and of an economy increasingly reliant on digital technologies. Schools are also seen as places to help overcome the inequities in our society, to create a more just and equal society. Schools are also seen as, as, as being important because of the intrinsic benefits of learning. So is it any of these things? Is the purpose of school all of these things? Are some of these pur purposes more important to you than others? Your position on the reason we have schools is dependent upon your philosophical underpinnings, your beliefs about why schools exist. So you have to examine what those beliefs are. An important thing that we talked about in our breakout groups. A quick slide here. I directed people to look at the Melbourne Declaration on the Educational Goals for Young Australians and I've given you the um, URL there. But they're the two broad goals. Equity and excellence confident, creative individuals and active and informed citizens. Schools are inherently political spaces. Government policy, such as that Melbourne Declaration on the Goals for Young People, special initiatives like the Rudd Government's Digital Education Revolution, decisions around funding derived from the Gonski Report, the recent or current seemingly endless review of the Australian curriculum are clearly political acts, but there are politics at all levels of a school from the top-down policies that are grounded in federal politics to the school-level policies, uniforms or no uniforms, performance reviews, standardised testing, etc., and to activ activities that take place in your own classroom. Schools are complex places. As Udell states, they are assemblages of different components, human, material, personal, organisational, that cut across each other. How all the elements that make up a particular school need to be understood and observed in order to unpack the complexities and to understand how it works. So when you are in schools in the second part of semester, look for the politics. Look at the various aspects of that particular assemblage of things and how they all come together. Look at the politics that shape that particular assemblage and ask yourself, what are your politics? 
Schools and education is always a hot topic in the press. The media is constantly focused on stories about education, particularly what happens in schools. Why is that? I think it's because everybody thinks they're an expert, as we've already discussed, so everyone has a view. Politicians, parents, industry and commerce are all stakeholders in schools and schooling and all have views about what schools should do. It also seems that no matter what schools do, everyone's a critic. Schools are positioned as a problem that needs fixing. One good example is Australia's relative standing in international education league tables. They always bring out cries that we don't have enough funding. Schools need to have more autonomy and operate more like a business. Teachers aren't good enough. Teacher education isn't producing the right sort of teachers. And so it goes. Student data also suggests that there may be some problems. Levels of student engagement in schools are low and falling. High proportions of students lose motivation from as early as grade four and five. They feel a sense of hopelessness and a lack of confidence. They find school mostly irrelevant. These are troubling messages indeed. So how, as a teacher, do you respond? How do schools respond? How you respond and how school respond, schools respond depends upon what collectively and individually people in those schools believe the aim of education is and what the purpose of schooling is. Also, it depends upon what they see their values as. And we talked about values in our interactive session. And some of the interesting things from my group about values was that the students felt that the schools that they attended valued discipline, respect, academic achievement, uh, sports, um, conformity, Interestingly, when I asked them what they valued, it was quite a different picture. The group, students in my group valued creativity and innovation, a sense of wonder and curiosity, uh, relationships, all those sort of warmer and fuzzier things. What do you value and how will that shape you as a teacher? I wanted to be a little provocative with this. A school's the only place we learn. I don't think they are. We learn from our parents, we learn from each other, we learn these days off the internet. Do we really need schools? Are teachers the only ones who can teach? I don't think so either. As I said, we learn from our parents. Our parents are our first teachers. People often learn from religious leaders. We learn from each other. We learn from observing what goes on in the world. We learn from television, we learn from the media, and we learn more from the internet. Do we actually need teachers? Do digital technologies render our current forms of school obsolete? Interestingly enough, we can go online to the Khan Academy and learn everything we need to learn about maths. Not a teacher involved, at least not in a classroom. I guess these are ideas that are current in a lot of the literature around education and may in fact render your job in the long term irrelevant or maybe not. Let's have a look at what some other people think about the future scenarios for schools. In 2001, the OECD developed a series of clusters of scenarios for what might happen into the future with schools. The first of these clusters really revolved around maintaining the status quo, not changing anything, more of the same. Very interestingly, Dan Lorty observed back in 2002 that education does not change at a rapid pace. The major structures in public education are much the same today as 30 years ago. One might even argue they're much the same as a couple of hundred years ago, but one might be a little cynical about that. Pressure for inertia is strong within the schooling sector. The structures that Lorty refers to here are not just the physical spaces of school, which are fairly much the same as 30 years ago in most cases, in some cases. Not just the buildings, the playgrounds, the corridors, but the social and cultural structures of schools, the hierarchical roles that people assume, the organisation of time, that's the timetable, the curriculum, and so on. The pressure for this inertia comes from a number of stakeholders. It comes from parents who may find it difficult to imagine alternatives to their own experiences. It comes from politicians who might share the same, who hark back to the days of Shakespeare and and Dickens as the canons of English literature and the idea of studying film as text is abhorrent to them. 
or to those who believe that history should be about British history and Australian history starts with the uh, white settlement. But pressure inertia, pressure for inertia within schools also remains strong from, from teachers and school leaders who resist anything but the most minor shifts in their role. Change in schools is difficult to generate. The second set of scenarios comes under the term reschooling, where we try to reinvent schools within fairly similar structures. A stronger culture of experimentation, inquiry learning, so a different set of pedagogies might emerge under these scenarios that are more innovative. Um, the other feature of these scenarios is a much stronger connection with community to share the responsibility for teaching through shared expertise and to share the physical structures that are schools. Technology has a role in these scenarios in trying to engage students in learning in ways that are much more relevant to them. In the most extreme of the scenarios, we see the movement towards de-schooling, a movement which has quite a number of supporters. We see the demise of schools as we know them to be replaced by a range of other providers of formal education with government withdrawing from direct involvement in schools. We've seen this scenario play out in the vocational education sector in Victoria over the last four years where TAFE colleges have had their funding slashed and the money redirected towards private providers. But with not a particularly happy ending at the moment, one of the biggest providers of vocational education is in under um, quite a cloud as I think it's about less than 10% of its students end up graduating. Mm. But we're also seeing the rise of non-formal learning networks, a trend that's gaining momentum in the business sector, but which some observers believe has potential application in the school sector. Examples could include the Khan Academy. Uh, check it out if you have not familiar with it, particularly the maths teachers amongst you. Online learning removed from school completely. Although recent moves in this arena suggest that Khan is looking to embed his academy in school curriculum in the United States rather than being separate from it. Doug Thomas and John Seeley Brown advocate a whole new culture of learning in a world of constant change that doesn't involve schools in their current form. Grounded in ideas of George Seaman who's proposing a new theory of learning based on the notion of connectivism. Not things we really have time here and now to explore in depth, but if you're interested, there are some references I've added to the Workshop One folder on the course website for you to pursue. So what do you think schools are for? Is schooling only to ever take place in formal collections of buildings and spaces we know as schools, taught only by people who are qualified and registered as teachers, or are there other possibilities? As a member of this profession in the early part of the 21st century, it's vital that you develop a view on this. Where do you sit? What role do you want to play in the evolution of schools? Examine what you think. I guess I tried to introduce a little bit of humour at this point by showing some memes. Um, but it raises the question of teacher you or real you. And where do you sit? What kind of teacher do you want to be? And the following memes probably typify some of the stereotypes that society holds about teachers. How do you respond to these memes? Do you want to be like these teachers? I suppose not. Have you had a great teacher and want to be just like them? Are there characteristics of a number of teachers you want to harness, mash up and emulate? One of the problems of asking you at this stage is that you probably don't know. You've had one experience of teaching, seen from the perspective of a student. But th from this experience, you come to teaching with theories of what a teacher should be. You don't come without some sort of baggage about teaching, or what a teacher is or should be or might be. In this course and in other courses, we ask you to examine those personal theories regularly in light of the new ideas and experiences you're exposed to in your teacher preparation program. Teaching is a highly complex profession, situated in highly complex places we call schools. Being a teacher involves many diverse responsibilities both in and beyond the classroom. Yes, you teach students the discipline you specialise in, 
but that is also complex as you have to deal with varying abilities and rates of progression in each of your classrooms. But schools today are so much more than teaching the discipline you specialise in or teaching the curriculum. So much happens in schools on a daily basis that goes beyond teaching the curriculum. Student welfare and well-being, dealing with parents, professional learning as a recipient and as a provider, extracurricular activities that are a rich part of the fabric of a school. What are your theories about these aspects of being a teacher? We watched this video in our class that provides an alternative to the memes. I'd urge you to watch and listen to the sorts of things that Bill Ayres talks about. Again, what kind of a teacher do you want to be? Lorty talks about us as teachers as being, especially beginning teachers, as the accretion of views, sentiments and implicit actions that are only partially perceived. In order to move beyond partially perceiving views, sentiments and actions, we want you all to engage in a critical reflection process. As Jeff talked to you about it in the class, to be reflexive. I've provided you with another model. Michael Crowhurst provided you with a, a framework, a reflection framework in his Thinking About Learning course, but this is another one. And you may come across others. Find one that suits you. I particularly like this reflection uh, framework because it helps me relate what I'm experiencing to myself, to theory, to interrogate my beliefs which underpin how I respond to a particular situation. And importantly, this framework urges you to reconstruct what would I do differently next time and why? These are really important questions that you need to constantly be asking yourselves. And we ask you to use these sorts of frameworks um, to respond to the experiences that you have whilst you're in schools during your the next two years and to respond to the ideas that we present to you during your coursework time here on campus. Next week, we'll focus on characteristics of effective learning environments and what this means for you as a teacher. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs>